but also I think so there's more. Okay. Might be a bit more blue, yeah. So oh, yeah. I guess start in a couple of minutes. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay. All right, thank you so much. That's all right. Are there a few more people coming or is this about it? Okay, start, cool. Um, so I'm just gonna go through renal neurology. Um, so in terms of the matrix, this is what we had and this is what you guys have. So I'm just gonna go through the main topics and just pretty much the buzzwords and the main things you need to know about it. And in terms of OSCEs, how to kind of ask the questions you need to ask. Um, so in terms of main things, um, with pathology, renal is a really huge topic. So if you guys in your own time kind of go through what a normal kind of glomerulus looks like, what, you know, an IM, what um, an IF kind of thing looks like and, you know, can you see? Yeah, so that's that doesn't come up, does it? Um, those are the kind of podocytes and things like that and knowing what each part of the pictures look like and things like that. And then in terms of, like, physiology, this is a really good link if you just want, like, a quick summary of what you need to know. But it's not really important for third year. It's more kind of if you need to know that stuff to remember everything. But mainly with renal and neurology, it's buzzwords, particularly in the um, written exams. So um, one of the main topics we had, um, especially in pathology, is glomerulonephritis, which is just um, kind of damage to the filtration system. So it can be classified as nephrotic or nephritic. So nephrotic, um, the acronym for that is LEAP. So high, high lipids, edema, which is generalized. So, you know, they have facial puffiness, hand puffiness and stuff, particularly in the morning. Um, low albumin and proteinuria. So that's the main thing. And they usually um, come in saying that they have really frothy urine. Um, they also get hypercoagulable, um, and this is generally due to podocyte damage because the proteins are able to be filtered through because the podocytes aren't actually keeping them in. Um, and then on the other side, it's nephritic syndrome. So that is Faro if you want to, but the main thing in comparison to nephrotic is the hematuria. So usually when there's blood in the urine, it's a nephrotic, nephritic syndrome. They also have um, low urine output, high blood pressure, and then all these other things as well. So in terms of dividing them, this is quite a simple way to do it. So mainly nephr nephrotic syndromes and minimal change disease, membranous, um, focal segmental glomerulosclerosis, and diabetic GN. Then nephritic, so the ones with blood in it. So it's post-strep and IgA, and those are the main ones. And then mixed is the ones that are kind of in the middle. So SLE, good pastures, Horsey immune and um, HSP, which you don't really need to know much about. It's more of a fourth year topic. So in terms of GN, like I've divided them previously into that just for like EMQs and things like that. But in real life, they are kind of on a spectrum. So nephrotic is mainly protein. Nephrotic is mainly blood, but then everything kind of sits in the middle. But just to kind of make it simpler in your minds, like minimal change is always just the protein sort of thing. And then like the IgA and the... Um, post-strep is usually just the blood in the urine. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, in terms of like pathophys, you don't really need to know much about it for exams and things like that, but to help with learning about it. So usually if there's proteins in the urine, it's because of damage to the podocytes. If there's blood, it's related to inflammation or like proliferation, so like increased vasculature. And then um, the really bad ones is necrosis and crescents, and that's mainly like the histopathology findings of them. So I'm just going to go through. So the things that I've highlighted or the things in bold are the buzzwords or things that you pick up in the actual EMQs that will point you towards them because usually it's just that huge list of all the GN types and you have to choose which one it is. So minimal change disease is in children. It's abrupt onset and they have the frothy urine, so the proteinuria. Um, and it's generally an idiopathic thing. It's about 90% idiopathic and 10% related to vasculitis and things like that. Um, so in terms of the buzzword for PATH, it's podocyte foot process effacement on um, electromicroscopy. And the management is corticosteroids. So minimal change is steroid responsive and most of it's cured in three months. And those are just kind of other things related to it. Um, so that's what the normal podocytes look like. And then with um, minimal change, they're just completely gone. So that's how all the protein goes through. So membranous nephropathy is like the adult version of minimal change. Um, 
So mainly frothy urine, but as I was saying, it was kind of on a spectrum. So there can be blood in it and still be membranous, but for EMQs, it's generally just the frothy urine. They can feel unwell, fatigued, and they might have high blood pressure as well. So um, in terms of path on light microscopy, they've got the thickened um, GBM with subendothelial spikes on silver stain. Um, and I know it's a lot of random words, but it's good to know, particularly for your path exams, because they do just kind of pop that in. And then in terms of the prognosis, there's a rule of thirds. So a third of them go into spontaneous remission, a third have persistent pro proteinuria and they're stable with that. And then a third go on to like end stage renal disease. So this is kind of the general management for all kind of nephrotic syndromes. So to deal with the edema, it's fluid restriction and low salt, low protein. Um, the high blood pressure is ACE inhibitors because they're nephroprotective statins for the uh, high um, lipids and then furosemide for the fluids as well and steroids to kind of actually manage the inflammation. So um, focal segmental glomerulosclerosis is actually like a histological finding. So it's what you look for. The causes are variable. So mostly the idiopathic, they might be related to like um, a bad outcome from a nephrotic disease, so like minimal change or membranous, or it can be for all these other reasons as well. But just knowing that it's not a cause, but it's actually just what it looks like on um, like the histology. So it's generally in like the EMQs, it's the young adults with the heavy proteinuria, um, and they usually have like a bad prognosis, so they end up getting um, end-stage renal disease with this as well. Uh, and so this is what it looks like. So it's just like the segments that are all kind of thickened up and things like that. And I don't know if they had them in your path exams or we had a lot of pictures like this. Um, yeah. And so diabetic nephropathy, for you guys, it's a R1 topic, but we didn't really have to know much about it. It's more of a fourth year topic as well. But the main thing that they have is someone with di diabetes for a long time and they have microalbuminuria. So just they have a lot of albumin um, in their urine. So it starts off with microalbuminuria and then it eventually goes into macro. Um, and it can cause chronic kidney disease and it's usually one of the main causes in westernized countries. Um, so in terms of the pathophys, and um, it's just the Kimmel, Stein, Wilson nodule. So instead of the, so if you compare that to the last slide where it's more kind of segments, this one's more kind of round spots everywhere and that's how you kind of differentiate it on the pictures. Um, but in terms of management, I don't think you guys need to know much. It's more like just diabetes control. So trying to prevent it in the first place. So keeping the glycemic, um, keeping the glucose like under control, making sure they get their regular um, investigations like the HbA1c and testing the urine regularly and things like that. But if they do start getting it, it's trying to prevent it from progressing as well as managing like the complications of it. So like with chronic kidney disease, they get blood pressure issues. So they get blood pressure management, they manage the lipids, and then they get on ACE inhibitors because, as I said, it was renal protective. Yeah. Um, and so this is just the pathophys or, like, how it happens. So someone's diabetes, because of all the sugar in the system, it ends up um, increasing the permeability of the vessels in the glomeruli and so it causes hyperfiltration. So usually what happens is a person with diabetes has normal um, EGFR for a while and then it increases and then it goes down really quickly and it's a permanent thing and as I said it was one of the main causes of chronic kidney disease. Um, so this is like the general kind of thing you need to know for OSCEs if someone comes in with a nephrotic syndrome. So it's just the acronym's OPAL. So edema management, so, you know, fluid restriction, if they're in hospital, monitoring their fluid output and input and things. Um, low salt diet, and then they can be on diuretics and then generally just dipsticking their urine regularly to check if there's any protein. Steroids, um, and if they're steroid resistant, they can be on NSAIDs and antibiotics and aspirin if needed, and that's for the anticoagulant kind of side effects or complications, and the antibiotics is more for any infection that might happen. And then learn is just education of the family, particularly in kids. They might want to know why this is happening and why they have to dip the urine every day and things like that. So these are the um, hematuria or nephritic syndromes. So post-strep, is in a child as well, and it's always after a upper respiratory tract infection or chorizal symptoms. So they're usually in the 
stem, it's coke or tea coloured urine, and they might have edema as well. So this is two weeks after a group A strep infection, so something like pharyngitis, so they might complain of a sore throat, or they might even say in the stem that you have pharyngitis or whatever, or it might be in vitigo, so any kind of skin infection. So the stem is like this five-year-old child has had a skin infection, is now better, and then two weeks later is having coat-coloured urine or something, and it's always post-strep GN. Um, and so in terms of the path, it's subendothelial humps or a starry sky appearance. And then in terms of investigations, you can do an A salt and anti-DNA A's B, which are just blood tests that check if they've had a strep infection recently. And then in terms of management to supportive, it usually goes on, goes away by itself. And if it doesn't, you know, you can do hypertension management, diuretics and dialysis. And then in terms of other complications of group A strep, they can also get rheumatic fever, which you might have talked about in your cardiac thing, and then GN as well. And then to prevent this from happening, you treat the pharyngitis before it gets bad, so with penicillin P. So IgA is the other um, blood in the urine one. So this is usually within, five, within a few days of the chorizal symptoms. So um, they usually have the erty and the hematuria at the same time, and they usually every time they get an erty, they also start peeing blood and then it kind of goes away. Um, it's generally in young adults, Asians, and it has a relationship to celiac disease. Um, generally in the EMQs, it says that they have, have had this before, or there's a family history of it and things like that. In terms of path, it's got diffuse mes mesangial IgA deposition in um, complement three. And then in terms of management, you just kind of observe it and if it gets bad, you can manage it. So in terms of renal, the management is very simple. It's related to what the complications are of um, the kidney. So the kidneys in charge of blood pressure and things like that, you always have to watch out for hypertension and things like that as well, if that makes sense. And um, steroids as well, if it's getting severe. And then HSP, which I mentioned earlier, is just kind of IgA that occurs in kids. It's very similar. It has like a rash on the legs and the buttocks and it has some abdo pain and things like that. But I don't think you really need to know much. Just it's going to be one of the options on the EMQs. So these are the mixed ones. So they can have hematuria, they can have nephrotic or there's somewhere in the middle. So anti-GDM disease or good pastures is in, the, in terms of buzzwords, just hematuria and hemoptysis. And um, it's caused by a collagen um, 4 antibody, which damages the lungs and the kidneys. Um, and it's generally, there's a family history of it. So in terms of PATH, it's linear stain for IgG. Other symptoms include anemia, fever, and shortness of breath. Um, and another kind of pathology buzzword is hemosiderin laden macrophages in sputum, which just means they have got blood stained <laughs> macrophages in their sputum as well. Um, and these are the anchor small vessel vasculitis. So there's Wegner's, Church, Churg, Strauss, and microscopic polyangitis. Um, Wegner's has a new name as well. But in terms of EMQs, Wegner's is usually there's um, nose symptoms, there's some sinus symptoms, eyes and lungs, and then there's hematuria as well. So all of these kind of have hematuria with them. While ch in comparison to Churg Strauss, it's allergic sounding. So they have like in high eosinophils, they might have a rash and they have like an allergic or an atopy sounding picture. Um, Wegner's is the C anchor positive in terms of blood tests and Churg Strauss is P anchor. And I just remember that by, it's the opposite of what the name is. So the C anchor goes with the one that's not C. Um, and then, <laughs> um, microscopic polyangitis um, is pretty uncommon. It's P anchor positive as well. Um, so membr membranoproliferative is a histological diagnosis, like I was saying. So some of them are just histological findings and have different causes, and some of them are actual, like, clinical pictures, if that makes sense. Um, and so this um, buzzword for PATH is tram tracking on, um, like, microscopy. Um, which just means doubling of the membrane. So this all looks a little bit thickened, if you can see, like all the black stuff compared to normal. Um, it's generally caused by autoimmune diseases or infections, and it can be nephrotic, and it can have some blood in the urine as well. And so lupus, 
the the six different types I don't think you need to know specifically but it's all kind of from nephrotic to nephritic and like each type has a different kind of clinical picture and severity but um, the buzzword for PATH is wire group wire loop glomeruli so it just um, they're just kind of a bit more thickened as well if that makes sense like those bits here it looks a bit more wiry yeah <laughs> um, complications is um, are of SLE so renal like a lot of people with SLE can die from the renal complications of it um, in terms of other things they might chuck into the buzzwords is like the male rash the discoid rash or you know females greater than males and it can also be drug induced as well um, so Alport's is hereditary nephritis and this is also related to collagen 4 but this is more of a mutation rather than anti-GDM where it's an antibody attacking the normal collagen 4. And this is related to like eyes and ears and kidneys. So I just remember they usually have some sensory neural hearing loss or like they have some eye irritation as well and they've got um, hematuria. And so this is the last one, and this is another histological diagnosis. So it's rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis. And so the causes, the acronym SLAM, so strep, lupus, anti-GDM, or any microangio hemolytic anemia, or a porcy immune um, glomerulonephritis. So the picture, it's, it's similar to the um, F, SGS, um, like the focal segmental, but it's more, it's going all the way around the main glomeruli in the middle. So it's kind of encasing all of it rather than with FSGS, it's like a little corners kind of in that crescent shape, if that makes sense. Um, and they generally present with like a loss of renal function over a short period of time and with really large crescents. Yeah. And this is just like another way to kind of separate it if you guys need to figure out a way. So like with GN, you can either divide it by the cause, you can divide it by what it looks like and things like that, or like um, what they're reactive to. But yeah, this is all from your PATH book, um, Underwoods or whatever, which has some really good explanations of all of them. Yeah, so I just have a few questions. Um, I guess I'll give you a minute and then I won't ask, do you guys want to put your hands up or should I just go through them? I'll just go through them. So 35, a 50-year-old female has had symptoms of sinusitis for the past three months and now has developed hemoptysis. Um, your analysis shows an active sediment with red blood cell class. What do you guys think it is? <laughs> yeah. Um, good pastures? I had um, Wegner's. <laughs> Um, just because it had the sinusitis. So with good pastures, um, it's just the lung issues, sorry, <laughs> the lung issues and um, the kidneys. While with Wegner's, so anything that has some random kind of face stuff, you can start thinking of the porcy immune things. And because there's no other ones on this list, Wegner's is the correct option. Um, but generally, it's got the sinuses and the noses and things like that. And they might say, like, on the chest X-ray, there's nodules, infiltrates, or cavities as well. Um, so the next one, um, a 23-year-old male who presents with microscopic hematuria two days after a viral upper respiratory tract infection has had similar episodes in the past. Yep. Yep. IgA. And then last one, a 70-year-old female with metastatic melanoma presents with generalized edema. A urine dipstick shows a lot of protein, no red blood cells, no white blood cells. Yep, membranous. Um, yeah, so membranous. Generally, if you, yeah, generally if it's um, got a random kind of relationship with cancer or HIV and things like that, it's membranous as well, which is not something I went into. But yeah, and so we'll just talk about renal failure, which is a big topic for you guys. Um, so acute renal injury or renal failure is the abrupt loss of kidney function and um, all the kind of functions of the kidney have kind of just stopped working. So they started retaining waste products, their volume regulation isn't there anymore, electrolyte disturbances, and they might start having high blood pressure. And so on the side, I've just kind of got the main symptoms that someone might come in with. So they might say, oh, you know, there's a lot of swelling, 
they might not say anything about electrolyte disturbances, but you know, you'll find that on the blood test. They might say they look pale, they might have bruising, or they just usually they just come in and they don't really have any sort of specific symptoms. They're just feeling a bit unwell. Um, and in with acute renal injury compared to chronic, it's usually reversible. So the causes of acute renal injury can be split up into pre-renal, renal and post-renal. So um, pre-renal renal is just related to like the vascular supply. So either there's not enough volume of blood or fluid in the body to actually get it to the kidneys or the fluid is in another space, so like third spacing, or the vessels going to the kidney aren't working anymore, particularly renal artery, artery stenosis. And this is probably the most common one and why, you know, people who are in hospital with other things end up getting some kidney injury as well is usually pre-renal. Um, other renal, um, so just in the middle, so actually related to the kidney, um, is damage to the structures. So the tubules, the glomeruli, the um, interstitial or the flow, so vascular. So the thing with renal causes of acute renal injury is that pre-renal causes can affect, can flow on. So just think if, you know, if you're not getting enough blood supply, then the actual stuff in the kidney is getting stuffed up as well. So, um, Things like acute tubular necrosis, GN, um, malignant hypertension, which I haven't gone into because hypertension is not on your renal matrix anymore. Uh, did someone go through it in the cardiac section? No? Okay. <laughs> um, and then like pregnancy-related health syndrome and stuff like that. And then um, post-renal is related to obstruction, so the urine can't get out and then it flows back and affects the kidney as well. So anything like stones, um, BPH malignancy or compression or tumours from elsewhere in the abdomen. So that's just another way to break it up in terms of flow charts, if you guys like that too. And also with um, intrinsic causes, it's all the kind of medication side effects or like nephrotoxic medications that can cause it as well. So this is a rifle criteria, which is a good way to break up renal injury. So, or like just um, renal damage. So it starts with risk and then goes to injury, then failure and then loss. And then this is the end stage renal disease. And so it's on the spectrum. I don't think you really need to know the specifics of what's each part, but just knowing that there's a rifle criteria out there. And then like in an OSCE you can say, I'd like to, you know, look at the rifle criteria and then put them on there and then see what management's there. Cause all the management relates to which part of the, rifle criteria they're on. And then so in terms of your OSCEs, if you get, say, someone with acute renal failure and you have to figure out what to do with them. So if you're going to ask them, you know, is there, has there been any blood loss recently or have you been any trauma? Um, you know, is there any volume restriction so they're not eating, they're not drinking or, you know, the urine output has decreased. They've got any shortness of breath or ankle swelling so the fluid's elsewhere, not going to the kidney. Um, if they have any past history of heart failure or liver issues or if they're on any of these medications because the ACE inhibitors actually constrict the vessels. Um, and then in terms of exam, you would do like a dehydration or volume status. So you'd check if they're dehydrated or not. You'd check if like the vitals for any hemodynamic instability. You do a cardio exam and abdo and renal exam. And then investigations, you do an FBE or UEC. And then if you think something like renal artery stenosis, you'll do an um, ultrasound, Doppler, look for stenosis. And then you can do a CT uh, or an MR angio or a renal angio to check if the vessels are still patent and they're still working well. Uh, in terms of renal causes, so you do a medication review. So like what medications are you on? Have you had any contrast recently or any scans? Are you on any of these antibiotics and things like that? Or they, you know, have a cancer, multiple myeloma, or they have any allergies? Um, and then you just go and see if they have, you know, any blood in their urine, if they have any edema or they've decreased urine output and things like that. So just go through all the GN questions. And then you can ask about any previous volume loss because, as I was saying, pre-renal can flow into renal causes. And then sepsis as well as a cause and then vasculitis things, so like bruises, diarrhea, abdo pain. Um, and so to compare ATN to I, AIN, um, I know these aren't on your matrix anymore, but um, we had a few questions where they were both there and you had to differentiate between them. So acute tubular necrosis is generally due to ischemia. So it's like the flow on effect from pre-renal causes. Um, and it's 
the buzzwords like tubular cast or like granular, muddy, brown kind of urine. And AIN is like an allergic thing. So it's usually related to drugs and autoimmune things. And so they have like a fever, a rash, and they have high eosinophils and then they have this um, acute increase in their creatinine. Um, yeah, and the examination is pretty much the same. You could add a heme examination if you wanted to. And then investigations, you do a urine dipstick, urine analysis, FBE, UEC, CRP blood cultures, and then a hemolytic screen if you think it's something related to that as well. And then so post-renal is all the obstructive things, so BPH, stones, all that kind of stuff I said earlier. And this is like the LUTs, the lower urinary tract um, symptoms, so like hesitancy, piss and juice. Do nocturia, um, urgency, frequency, dysuria, incontinence. Um, and then, you know, if they have loin to gro groin pain, nausea, vomiting, rolling around and pain sort of stuff. If they had any past surgeries, particularly urology procedures, um, blood in the um, urine or decreased urine or painful urination and things like that. If they've lost any weight, especially hematuria that's painless is really related to bladder malignancy, which could be a cause of the acute renal injury. Loss of appetite, loss of weight, all those constitutional symptoms. And then any kind of bowel symptoms, if they've had like, you know, an abdominal cancer of one sort, like a bowel cancer, anything like that. Um, and it's the same pretty much exam. So, you know, fluid status, vitals, renal, abdo, and then you can do a genital urinary and a DRE if you really want, you don't really need to. Um, and then investigations of bladder scan or as well as the renal ultrasound would be good. So bladder scan would say if, you know, they've got a dilated bladder or, you know, there's fluid that's obstructed and things like that. A CT KUB for stones, um, CT abdo pelvis, if you're thinking there's a malignancy or things like that. And then PSA, UEC and FBE. The PSA is not very specific, but you can chuck it in if you want in an OSCE um, and then a pilogram as well. And so management is just first, especially because the main cause is pre-renal, it's to maintain hemodynamic stability. So doctors ABC, resus, particularly fluid resus. Um, and generally, they are in hospital already, but if they're not, hospitalise them and treat the cause. So um, monitoring with a strict fluid chart, consider catheterization if you need to, to help with the fluid chart. And then um, aim for stability. So if they've got low volume, increase the fluids. But if they're, you know, got heart failure or something and the fluid's everywhere, you can treat the cause and, you know, trial for rizomide and things like that. And then electrolytes, so they usually have high potassium because the kidney sec um, excretes all the potassium. They also have a metabolic acidosis, which has been in a few questions as well. Um, so you'd treat that by, you know, um, treating the hyperkalemia and that usually corrects itself. And then a medication review to see if there's any medications causing it. And then consider dialysis if it goes on for a while and it's getting really bad. And so complications, they're more likely to get chronic kidney disease in the future. And I think that says fluid overload. Um, they usually have uremia, hyperkalemia, acidosis and electrolyte disturbances. They have high blood pressure as well during this period um, and they can get irreversible end stage renal failure as well and they might get bleeding disorders. Right, so chronic renal failure is a renal injury and a reduction in the GFR less than 60 for more than three months. Um, so symptoms, usually it's asymptomatic to begin with and as you kind of progress down this graph, you get worse and worse. So usually people are here for a while and then it kind of suddenly goes down and it gets really bad. But usually the first symptom is like a lot of urination at night, um, which is also related to BPH and things like that, but it can be a factor related to chronic renal failure as well. Puritis, hypertension, and the sallow skin that a lot of renal physicians talk about is like not yellow, not particularly pale, but somewhere in the middle. Um, edema or like um, low urine output to no urine output as well. And then the non-specific things that usually come first are the nausea, vomiting, lethargy and the loss of appetite. And then in terms of blood tests, usually chronic renal failure is found just by a regular blood test. Um, so, you know, high creatinine, high urea or metabolic derangement, particularly that metabolic acidosis that I was talking about. And the causes are generally... Um, the top three in like Australia would be the diabetic nephropathy, the hypertension, and then a chronic GN that's just progressed over time. And all these kind of things are smaller parts of it. And it can be a particular cause. Well, like, you know, polycystic kidney disease is also when they kind of get chronic renal failure in their forties and things like that. Um, yeah. And so this staging is good to know compared to the rifle criteria. I think there are a few questions about what stage someone is in. 
Um, so stage one, so the um, GFR is good. They've just got some kidney damage, but because the kidney can like, not repair itself, but it can kind of compensate for any damage. It doesn't actually change the GFR, but you just, if you think that they've had, you know, some past history or they've like, got those risk factors, you'd monitor closely for high blood pressure and you just keep watching that GFR and wait. Um, stage two is 60 to 89. And so it's a loss of that renal reserve and there's mild hypertension. And so you just manage any of those symptoms of um, edema, the hypertension um, and things like that. And that kind of flows on to stage three, which is 30 to 59 GFR. And this is when the abnormal biochemistry and the actual changes in the electrolytes start happening. And then usually they have high blood pressures that's not being able to be controlled with all those antihypertensives. Um, and then in this stage, you can go from anything from mild symptoms to quite severe. Um, and then stage four is 15 to 29 GFR, and they have the same pre same similar symptoms to stage three, but they might start getting anemic as well, and the uremia might start happening. And then stage five is end-stage kidney disease or renal disease, and that's less than 15, and that's a good number to know. Um, and they have all those things that were mentioned earlier, as well as those bleeding issues. And so in terms of the general management, depending on the actual symptoms rather than the stage they're in is what the management's based on. So, you know, if they've got edema, you do all that um, fluid management, antiemetics if they're vomiting or nauseated, iron supplements and um, EPO if they've got anemia caused by a renal condition, and that's usually normal acidic anemia, um, electrolyte management, acid base, things like that. And manage that hypertension and then prepare for renal replacement is a really important thing. And it's usually in the stage three to four that you start mentioning it to people like, you know, in the future, this is going to progress and you might have to, you know, go on dialysis or you might need to start being worked up for a transplant. And then stage five is when you need to do the dialysis stuff. So this sometimes can happen quite suddenly. And so you need to have started doing the prep in this period. And this is just kind of a general fluid balance management sort of thing. So you measure their weight daily, you adjust the fluid intake according to the weight, and then salt restricted diet and loop diuretics and things like that, which is very similar to heart failure and just like any kind of overload. Um, and so chronic renal failure. So the complications are ABC, so anemia, normocytic, acidosis, bone issues, so renal osteodystrophy, blood pressure, and cardiovascular issues as well. And then so just always discuss the eventual need for dialysis and the progressive decline early. So in terms of renal replacement, this could be an OSCE. So in terms of explaining it like an indication for the patient, like you need this because you'll event, like your renal function will eventually get worse and won't work at all. Procedure, like depending on the type. So, you know, if it's hemodialysis, we'll need to start prepping you. You know, it can take up to three months for the AV fistula to work. So you'll have this kind of blood vessel thing in your arm, which we need to keep healthy and non-infected and things like that, just in case your function declines. During, you know, hemodialysis, you have to come into the hospital, you have to be in a chair linked up to a machine that filters your blood for you um, for, you know, three or four hours, three times a week. Uh, and then after, you know, there's complications related to it and things like that. The benefits, the risks, and the alternatives is always transplant and things like that. Um, so hemodialysis is the one with the fistula. It's in the hospital and it's generally more effective. Um, peritoneal, it's overnight, convenient. They, um, they can do it at home, but they can't have had any surgeries on their abdomen. Um, and then renal transplant. So if they do have one, they're in an increased risk of skin, blood, and cervical cancer. And that's been questions before. Um, and they're usually on these medications, so steroids, um, trachylimus, and this one too, is just immunosuppressants. Um, and so counsel when they're in stage four, educate the types and prepare them and the fistula six months, sorry, or greater than eight weeks to mature. And these are other indications in the short term or like acute issues that you can use dialysis. So acidosis of this extreme electrolytes, intoxication, fluid overload, and uremia, and that acronym is AEIOU. And so this is just a good picture, if you guys like pictures, um, just to explain it to patients or for your own knowledge. So, you know, you have to make that fistula, it goes out into a system and comes back in and you have to do it, you know, four hours, three times a week in the hospital. While this you can do at home, it usually takes longer and um, it's overnight. Yeah. So 
obstruction. So first thing is urolithiasis. So just stones in the kidney, bladder or ureter. The kind of patient in the um, stem would be like, you know, they have a family history, they're a male with ureteric colic, so the severe loin to groin, groin pain, and they cannot lie still. So they're squirming around in bed or they're just walking constantly or they're on the floor. And they usually have hematuria, the sweating and vomiting. So they're really in a lot of pain. Um, and so the types of stones, so you can have the calcium oxalate, the magnesium, so the math ones or the stru struvite. And this is the infected ones, and they cause the staghorn calculi, the uric acid, which is related to gout, and the cysteine ones. But generally, it's these two. Um, so risk factors, they might have family history or past history. Gout is related to the uric acid. Um, yeah, and then so the three points of impaction are the PUJ, so like in the, pelvi the renal pelvis, over the pelvic brim, and then just here, the ureteral vesicle juncture um junction yeah and there's just to know that because that's some questions as well and so in terms of causes usually they have risk factors and then like they might be dehydrated they might just make them on their own and there's usually a family history of that they might have high um, pth or high calcium genetic mutations they might have a uti which is related to the struvite um, type or they might have a renal disease as well and some drugs might increase your risk and this is just in terms of um, EMQs and just x-rays, not all of the types of um, um, stones actually show up. So most of them do, but in particular, the urate ones don't. And there's been a few questions of um, like someone with a past history of gout or has a history of gout um, and, you know, you can't actually see anything on an x-ray, but they've got all the symptoms of the loin to groin pain. It's usually the urate one. All right, um, and so in terms of investigations, you know, a urine dipstick would show, which will show hematuria. You can do a urine MCS if you think there might be an infection as well. Bloods, a UEC, CRP, a CMP, and you can consider doing uric acid levels for if you think it's related to gout. And then the imaging would be an abdo X-ray, and it misses the urate stones and some of the mixed infective ones. Uh, but the, you know, the gold standard is that unenhanced spiral CT. Um, in terms of management, you'd hospitalise them. So analgesia, so NSAIDs, particularly Ketorolac, which is really good for colic or spasmic pain, and that's an IM injection. You can just give them an anti-emetic like ondansetron, four milligrams to eight milligrams, um, and get. So you're trying to get rid of the stones. So in terms of sizing, if it's less than one centimeter, it can pass naturally. So you just watch and wait, and you might get them to go home. And then if it's greater than one centimetre, it's intervention. So you'd call it urology and you'd, they'd do like the laser thing or they might try and resect it, get it out. And then prevention in long term, so they'd increase fluid intake. They can use alkalizing agents like ural um, and they can reduce calcium excretion with thiazide if that's related to it and then treat the stone. So if they've got gout, you know, you need to control the gout as well. And the complications, you know, if it stays there, they can get progressive hydronephrosis and the staghorn calculi, because it's so large, can damage the renal tissue as well. And so this is just from up to date in terms of what to do. So if they're not completely unwell, you can just wait and watch. But if it doesn't, they'll like urologic management. And then this is just another question. So something year old man presents to the ED with acute right-sided loin pain and microscopic hematuria. His past um, history includes high blood pressure, intermittent angina, and occasional gout. A plain abdominal, abdominal film shows no opacities or calculi. A CT urogram shows accumulation of contrast at the right PUJ. Answer. Yep, J. Yeah, so just the gout and the fact that you can't actually see it kind of points you to the uric acid. All right, so a UTI, they're generally women, so they have a dysuria, the suprapubic pain and frequency, and on urine dipstick, they'll have positive nitrites and leaks. So a, a UTI is an infection of the urinary tract, so including cystitis, which is a blood infection. Um, women are at four times more risk than men just because of the length of the urethra. And the peak is kind of the 16 to 35 year olds. And then risk factors, sexually active, young, increased infection. So if they have a catheter, if they're immunocompromised, or they've got diabetes, if they've had a past history, particularly in females, and um, obstruction because it leads to stasis. 
Um, and so in terms of managing it, you need to classify it. So an uncomplicated case is usually a woman who's like 20 years old and usually gets them a lot, you know, um, or just it's um, not like anyone unusual. So like a male, any malformations, um, if they're immunocompromised or they've got voiding dysfunction already, just because there might be another reason why they're getting a UTI. And so the cause is bacteria. So most of them are E. coli, other things, staph, um, and then all these other ones as well. And these are usually the recurrent UTI. And so some people can actually be asymptomatic, particularly in elderly, if anyone's um, you know, an older delirious patient might have a UTI and you should always check that, even if they're not saying they have any symptoms or they're not incontinent. But if someone's incontinent or have a ch change in mental state or fatigue, you can consider doing um, a urine dipstick and a urine MCS. And in children, a fe fever might be the only symptom of a UTI as well. So um, in terms of OSCEs, if it's a man who comes in with UTI symptoms, it's complicated and you should consider investigation, particularly um, during or after you, um, doing the antibiotics. And so you can do a urine dipstick on everyone, but a urine MCS, if it's recurrent, complicated, if they're pregnant and child or they're elderly, just because they might have an odd bug. Um, in terms of antibiotics, it's trimethoprim for three to five days or cephalexin, depending on the resistance. That's why you do the MCS. Um, you can do analgesia and like ural, so the alkalizing sachets. And then in terms of long-term prevention, urinate after intercourse, wipe front to back and empty your bladder fully. And then cranberry products, a lot of people talk about using them as prevention. They're actually not, um, there's no evidence that they actually work long-term or they have any kind of benefit. So you can not recommend that. And then um, recurrent UTIs, you can use like prophylactic low dose trimethoprim or this, which is another kind of antibiotic. And complications, so there's pyelonephritis, urinary retention, recurrent UTIs, and then in pregnancy, preterm delivery and miscarriage. So pyelonephritis, so this e either occurs from ascending infection from the bladder or it can be um, from spread from the blood vessels. So it's generally bacterial um, and if it's hemato hematogenous spread, it's staph. Um, and so in terms of clinical features, they're a little bit more unwell than someone with cystitis or a UTI. So they might have that dysuria and frequency, particularly if it's an ascending effect infection, but they generally have this flank pain and fever, nausea and vomiting. And usually they, they just look unwell. Um, and then investigations, a urine MCS, and they usually have significant um, bacteria in the urine. And then you can consider doing blood cultures if they seem really unwell as well, FBE, CRP and UEC. And so you just kind of classify it to management. So if they're mild, they might not need to be in hospital. So you can probably manage it as an outpatient or as GP. And you use augmentin, cephalexin or trimethoprim. And then if they're severe, you need to hospitalize them and give them IV gent and IV amoxicillin. And just in terms of OSCE things, you know, you say you would use empirical management until we get the MCS results and then we'd switch to what's sensitive, things like that which examiners always like. And then um, once they're well again, and once this is over, you should do the repeat urine culture because there might still be stuff in there. And so complications, if, there's, if they aren't getting better after a few days, you can consider doing an ultrasound or CT because they might get one of these complications. So hydronephrosis, a renal abscess, a renal infarct or perinephritic collections, which is what's happening here. And then so chronic pyelonephritis is just renal scarring. So it's long-term kind of reflux back from the bladder into the kidney and causing damage. And it's usually associated with recurrent infections and can be associated with TB as well. And they have the like granulomas in there. Um, in terms of other infections, if it's a proteus infection, which is one of the kind of less major UTI infections, it can cause like these yellow macrophages in the kidneys that can look like malignancy as well. Um, in terms of presentation, it's usually a chronic kidney disease or with a past history of recurrent UTIs. And then the management is usually treating the underlying cause. So this, some of this usually happens in PEDS, so in the first few years of life. And then if they have a congenital thing here, like the um, valves aren't working, they might have surgery to fix that. But usually if it's in an adult, they'll just do like consider antibiotic prophylaxis. And then if 
the kidney is really bad and it's getting infected a lot and things like that, they might just remove the kidney. And so BPH, um, so this is really common. So 75% of men aged 70 to 80 are affected. This is more of a GP topic, but you guys can know a little bit about that. So risk factors are increasing age, family history, abdo, abdominal obesity, so like any of those metabolic syndromes, erectile dysfunction, um, and then cardiac disease. And so this is benign um, hyperplasia. So just like stressing that if this was an OSCE, that, um, that it's not actually malignancy. Um, and its presentation is those Lutz syndrome. So usually um, BPH is in that transitional zone just around here, and that's causing all the symptoms, while malignancy can happen anywhere. But in this diagram, it's just on the side. And, yeah, so it's usually this transitional zone here that usually has that hyperplasia. And so the etiology is they think it's related to the testosterone like um, active part but the trigger is kind of unknown but because so many people as they get older get it they think it's just a normal kind of part of aging um, and there's some persistent inflammation as well and so for PATH it's usually enlarged multiple circumscribed solid nodules and cysts and the histology is just hyperplasia of smooth muscle and fibrous tissue edema and um, hyperplastic sacs and so the nodules compress the urethra and yeah and so the complications include increased infection rate urinary retention and obstructive nephropathy which can cause that AKI that I was talking about earlier and so these are the lower urinary tract symptoms so you can have bladder sensation changes you can have storage symptoms which are irritative so like UTI kind of symptoms and then you have voiding symptoms which is more related to like um, obstruction stuff, so like BPH, malignancy, things like that. And so the voiding symptoms include hesitancy, poor stream, intermittent stream, straining, dribbling, and these are all the kind of things, medications as well. Um, storage symptoms can be related to neurological causes like MS, um, and then bladder sensations, generally a neurological cause. And then just a thing, if anyone comes in with acute re urinary retention and it's an enlarged bladder that's tender, you have to catheterize immediately before you do anything else. While chronic urinary retention is generally like a complication or a side effect of having any kind of obstructive symptom because it happens over a long term, your body kind of gets used to it and it's not painful when it gets enlarged. And then any um, person that comes in with hematuria, recurrent UTIs, acute or chronic urinary retention or urinary incontinence are known as complicated patients, particularly if they're coming in with BPH-like symptoms and they should have further urologic follow-up. And just OSCEs and life just always ask about quality of life because you only manage them if they're having um, issues, like it's actually affecting them. But this is just some diagnosis, like differential diagnoses of anyone that comes in with positive lower, lower urinary tract symptoms. And so there's this international questionnaire that's specifically for BPH as well. Um, so these are all the kind of things. So there's usually can break them up into obstructive things, specifically at the prostate, neurological things, and then just random like medication, sleep apnea or cardiac things. Um, and so in BPH, firm, rubbery um, kind of prostate on a DRE, while if it's extremely nodular, you always consider malignancy. Not, it's not very specific for malignancy, but it's something that you have to rule out always, especially if it's nodular. Um, investigations, you can do a urine analysis and a urine MCS if you think it's a UTI, urine histology, um, cytology, sorry, if it's hematuria, um, bloods, you can do a PSA, um, and then imaging renal tract ultrasound. And so urology referral, if anyone's less than 45 years, have an abnormal DRE, severe symptoms or incontinence. And so this is just a <laughs> um, breakdown of what you think it is. And so this is the management of BPH. So the management's only if it's affecting the quality of life. So the non-pharmacological is like the behavioral modification. So usually they have nocturia, so avoid fluids before bed or like alternative things like this thing called sore palmetto, which I think they just eat, but there's not much evidence for that. Um, there's tamsulosin, which is the medical management, and they have all these side effects and do not use as Viagra. You always have to ask about that. And then this is um, another type of medication 
dutasteride also has quite similar side effects and then you can do the combination and usually you trial one you go to the next one and then you do the combination and if none of them are working you can go to surgical management like a TERP and knowing like the indications the procedure the benefits and risks for that is really good because it could be an OSCE top. And so cancers, um, so prostate cancer, the buzzwords are kind of osteosclerotic metastases, particularly at the back. Um, it's usually an adenocarcinoma and it's in the peripheral zones of the prostate. Um, it's usually in older men and the high risk if they have first degree relatives or you know have first degree with BRCA1 or 2. And they usually have those bladder outlet obstructive symptoms that I was talking about with those constitutional symptoms as well. And so you can do... So in terms of screening, there's no recommended screening for prostate cancer anymore. And so they can you can use a PSA as like a diagnostic tool, but it's not very specific. So um, if it's high, um, you can consider doing other investigations after that. But, you know, it's not it can also be increased because of prostatitis or BPH. DRE in terms of a screening is also not recommended anymore, but you can do it if there's symptoms. And then a prostate biopsy is done for symptoms. And particularly with a high PSA and an abnormal DRE, you'd send them there anyways. And so the Gleason score um, is good to know for PATH. So it's just they take a lot of different pictures, a uh, little different um, biopsies of different parts of the prostate, and then they kind of add it together. And then they give you a number which shows whether it's aggressive or non-aggressive. So anything greater than six is cancerous, and aggressive tumours are often nine plus in that. Um, defines management for oncology. And so management, MDT, monitoring of act, um, active surveillance, particularly if it's a slow-growing cancer. Um, surgical, they can get rid of the prostate. They can use chemotherapy and then hormone therapy like Solidex or um, can be used in their kind of implants that people have in their tummies that last about three to four months. Um, and then radiotherapy as well. And if it's spread quite far, you can consider palliative management as well. The five-year survival is actually really good at 95%. And this is just the tumor staging that you can look at your own time. And so this is the other cancer. So kidney cancer is um, usually renal cell carcinoma in the adult. So it's usually hematuria, people who are smoking, obese, older, and they have some radiation to the abdomen. And then in children, it's wombs, Wilms tumors or nephroblastomas. And so they can have, it's usually asymptomatic in kids, they usually have a lump in their abdomen. Um, but other things are like flank pain, palpable mass, distal effects, like polycythemia or high calcium. You can do all these investigations, particularly an abdopelvic ultrasound and then a CT and then biopsy. And this is all the kind of management. And usually with cancers, they have pretty similar, you know, surveillance, chem chemotherapy, surgical palliation. So it depends. Um, so painless hematuria is really related to bladder cancer. It's kind of the buzzword. But with kidneys, it's usually painless as well. But painful hematuria is usually related to like cysts hemorrhaging or like a UTI or something like an, inflama like an inflammatory and like an effective cause, if that makes sense. But check that. <laughs> um, Bladder cancer is painless hematuria until proven otherwise. So the types are usually urothelial cells, so smokers, OC um, health kind of things like amines or polycythic, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. Um, you can have squamous cells, which is usually like um, people from Egypt and they've had like this infection and adenocarcinoma is really uncommon. Um, so you always do a urine analysis with cytology if someone comes in with painless hematuria as well as the bladder and renal ultrasound and all these other things, including a cystoscopy. And so this is all the management, which is pretty similar. So testicular cancer is the young men, and they um, have a, five, a really good five-year survival rate. And so the types are pure seminoma, mixed seminoma, and then all these other ones, which are like the sex cell tumors and lymphomas and things like that. And it's usually a slow, painless, unilateral enlargement of the testes. Um, and there's no redness and there's no pain. Um, and they can have these secondary things which shows this metastasis, so like gynecomastia or a hydrocele. Um, 
tumor markers AFP and beta HCG are really good and LDH is just a cancer marker in general. You do an ultrasound color Doppler, but in terms of staging, you do a chest X-ray, a CT, a chest abdo pelvis, and management is just to get rid of the testicular cancer. And so last one, so polycystic kidney disease. So you have autosomal recessive and autosomal dominant. So autosomal recessive are the children. So it the cysts occur in the distal and collecting ducts and the gene related to it's this one. And it's a pediatric issue. So they're born with this and they usually die quite soon after birth. Um, and this is what it looks like on histology. And this is just from the past slides from last year. And then autosomal dominant, so they have multiple cysts, and these are the big, really cystic-looking kidneys, and they usually have cysts in the liver as well. Um, and then on exam, they have belottable kidneys, which are really painful. Um, there's two chromos two kind of genes related to it on chromosome 16 or 4, and usually they're asymptomatic at birth, and there's onset at 40 or 60 years where they might get chronic renal failure, they might have hypertension, abdo pain, and then this is the kind of painful hematuria. Um, internal complications, A, B, C, P, D, P. Um, so aortic root dilation, very aneurysm, cysts in the liver, pancreas or spleen, diverticulosis and prolapse. And these are really good um, complications to know because they come up. And then so the end stage renal disease that they get is um, just, it's going to happen. So it's good to counsel them about that. Investigations include ultrasound, regular BP monitoring, and then a 24 hour urinary protein and a CTKUB to rule out cancer because they can look quite similar. Um, so it's just symptom management. So, you know, blood pressure, if they get infections, give them medications. Um, if they get stones, treat them and then genetic counselling and screening the siblings and checking the blood pressure in the siblings. And the last thing is just the testicular conditions that you guys have to know about. And so the main thing to know is whether it's painful or painless. So testicular tumours are painless. Hydrocele's are usually painless and they transilluminate when you put a light through them. So you just shine a torch on them. And then testicular torsion is the acute onset abdomen, um, abdomen or groin pain. Um, and then epididymoarchitis is Usually it's quite a tender, red, swollen um, scrotum, and they usually are sexually active as well. So it's related to STIs like gonorrhea and chlamydia. And yeah, that's it. And then there's some questions at the end if you guys want to go through. Okay, that's it. Any questions? No? Good. <laughs> I, um, good. I found we have other leftover parks from, um, oh, yeah. where are the things? Oh, um, I uploaded them on the USB. Oh, fuck. I just asked the guy to. They're online. He's coming, he's coming, yeah, he's coming. I think he's going to put them up. Okay. Hey, how are you going? Good, good to meet you. you. Do you have the slides on USB? So oh, I do you want me to grab yours? Is that okay? Just check yeah. them Hi everyone, this will literally take 30 minutes, I promise. It won't take long. And I have like three words on each slide. It's the bare minimum you need to know for the exams. So it'll be really quick. I'm just waiting for USB. Someone's getting the slides, sorry. <laughs> oh, actually. That's right. Um, I put the um, pre slides up. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, they're the same. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, legend. Oh, this is actually a um, PDF. That's right. Just go to the next slide, see if it's come up. Ooh. Oh, I think, sorry, it's because I took my USB out. Sorry about that. Oh, I'll, I'll put it onto the desktop. Cheers.
Perfect. So, thank you very much all for right. that. Thanks so Thanks much. Much. Thanks you're right. No, you're right. No dramas. We'll get started in just about two minutes once people come back or so. Right, yeah, I might get started. Um, so everyone's previous slides are probably really pretty with lots of information on them, and they're good for you to look at and study and learn about, and one is the bare minimum. You've been here for a long time, over two days, and you don't want to have someone just read off slides really quickly. Um, so we should be done in 30 to 40 minutes, hopefully. So ID, antibiotics, and derm, they're topics that are pretty small, with the exception of ID and antibiotics. We need to spend a bit of time on them, but derm, spend like an hour learning it or so, no more than that. Um, so I'll cover them, nothing extra. Don't use it as a reference, just read it two or three days before your exam, and it's got lots of buzzwords. If you read this and know what all we should do, hopefully, okay. Um, overview, ID and antibiotics, they're very specific questions, so I'll give you some exact symptoms, nothing general, and I'll ask for a diagnosis or an antibiotic you give. And also, they're really big on th like causes of diarrhea or travel-related illnesses. Derm, they'll just ask you for the different types of skin cancers, and they might give you a question that's got a bit of detail about uh, melanoma. That's your thing. Sorry, it didn't cut off too well. I've just covered up the stuff I'm not going to talk about um, because it's generally quite specific and not really uh, exam question related. Um, antibiotics, we'll learn about these conditions. Don't learn the drugs. Don't sit down and learn about moxicillin and the side effects that you're wasting your time. Just learn what it is used for. So we'll learn these conditions and the drugs for them, not the, not the conditions for certain drugs. Um, derm, yeah, we'll cover that stuff. Cool. So infectious disease, so you need to know certain types of bacteria. So it's good to have an idea in your mind of what gram positives and gram negatives are. Because an easy question is, which of the following uh, drugs would you give for a gram positive cocci? That can be a question I'll ask. It's pretty simple though, gram positives is streps, staphs, and anything with cocci in the name. Everything else is a gram negative. Then you need to know some specific drugs. So you need to know that Legionella is a gram negative rod. And I think of like Legionella is a disease that's occurred in air conditioning units, like it floats around in there. So I always think of like a big cooling cylinder that looks like a negative and it's a rod, so gram negative rod. Um, nice serio, you need to know it's a gram negative diplococci. Commit them to memory because it's generally a specific question about exactly those terms. Cool, pneumonia, um, they'll give you a situation and ask you what is the cause of pneumonia or the antibiotic to give. Don't waste your time with Curb65 and Smart Cop. they won't ask a question on it. Also, when I say they won't, this is just as a general rule. Anything anyone, te <laughs> <laughs> anything anyone tells you about, oh, that's the right answer to this exam, but they don't know what they're talking about. No one knows the correct answers except the faculty. So take everything with a grain of salt that everyone says. Um, basics, community acquired pneumonia. On the exam, they'll say someone's coughing at lots of gunk, and they might say on an x-ray it's affecting a certain load. Whereas with an atypical pneumonia, they'll have more flu-like symptoms and there'll be someone like you or I who's otherwise healthy. Um, hospital acquired pneumonia, I haven't seen a question on that before, but basically if you're in more hospital for more than two days and you get pneumonia, they call it a hospital acquired one. Now this is important. So you need to know mild, moderate and severe and the antibiotics you give for each. I like to think about the mild pneumonia. So if you or your friends had pneumonia before, you go to the GP and you walk away with amoxicillin or doxycycline. If you see patients in the hospital that have severe pneumonia, they'll be on IV keftriaxone. Um, so people talk about ABCD, ABCD, pneumonic, pneumonic. Just remember mild is a moxy doxy. Moderate is Ben Pen and doxy. Ben Pen is generally given IV. You can't just give them as a tablet. And Keftri uh, severe is keftriaxone or azithromycin. So remember your mild and your severe causes. Again, they can be exam questions or really easy to pop up on the OSCE. They'll say, what do you want to give them? But just think, what would you get if you went to the GP? What have you seen patients getting in the uh, hospital before? Things to know, so these are the buzzwords I'd recommend you remember. That's what red currant jelly looks like, how gross is it? Um, so I've covered these up so you can test them in your own time, but I'm not gonna waste your time waiting for someone to put their hand up and answer it. So rust, streptococcus pneumonia is the buzzword for that one. If you get an older person who's a smoker, they'll commonly have something like a mophilus influenza. 
if they have an abscess, like those weird swinging fevers, or they show a picture of an x-ray that looks a little bit like TB, and it's got like a fluid line, that can be caused due to a staph infection. If they're an alcoholic and they talk about red currant jelly, you're gonna have Klebsiella. And finally, it's a young person like you or I who's feeling pretty well, and they don't mention anything about a loba pattern on an x-ray, you've got to think of mycoplasma pneumonia. Please remember them, because they're really easy questions to ask you. These are the ones that are a bit more vague. It's probably worth knowing them, but it's not gonna probably come up on the exam. If someone's interacting with parrots or birds, chlamydia, don't know how to say it. Um, if they have these things, so they have diarrhea and some risk factors, like they're interacting with potting mix, like they're a gardener, or there's someone that's been around air conditioner, so an air conditioner cleaner, you've got to think of Legionella. And remember, it's a gram negative rod. Please remember that. If they're a person with HIV or AIDS, PJP is the common one they can have. And if the person uh, interacts with rabbits, Franciella. So these ones aren't that important to know, but just have a crack if you've got time, okay? But the, first, the previous page is where you should spend your time remembering things. Overall, uh, for meningitis, know the four causes they've got. You should know the symptoms by now, and if you don't, just try and learn them. They're not too complicated. CSF, we need to know different patterns in the CSF, CSF and the management. So overall, strep pneumonia, Neisseria meningitis, that's a really bad one where the people get the non-blanching rash. Haemophilus, and if they're a child or an alcoholic, they can get listeria. So they're the four causes. Know the second and fourth one and the people that they affect. The CSF, so if you do a CSF culture and it's a bacterial meningitis, you'll find their glucose levels are really low. I think of that as the bacteria is eating on the glucose and protein's high because they're pooing it all out. The virus, they can't eat because they're viruses, so glucose will be normal. And the viruses themselves are protein, so protein will be high. Bacteria will also be a bit cloudy. Management, everyone gets keftriaxone. If you're worried about them being uh, having listeria, you'll give them Benpen. But because meningitis is pretty severe, most people will just get the first two. And also dexamethasone, not an antibiotic, but you'll give it to stop the swelling. So if they ask you in an OSCE, try and say those three um, three drugs. And if you say Ben Penn is for listeria, they'll be very impressed. Um, so now I'm just covering this up so when you look at it, you can test yourself so you know it. So this condition is very bad. It's similar to cellulitis, but they'll be very, very sick. If you palpate the area that's inflamed, you might feel gas bubbles. And you give them meropenem and they need surgery. If it was just cellulitis, you give them flucloxacillin. But in this condition, you give meropenem. So this is necrotizing fasciitis. So just think surgery and meropenem. And if it's cellulitis, not this neck fasci, give them fluclox. And that attacks staph, which is the common cause of the cellulitis. This is the absolute bare minimum stuff you need to know. And I think this stuff hopefully will help you answer the exam questions. This one, if they're a diabetic, you give them Kiptaz. And if they're not a diabetic and it's like a surgical infection, you give them fluclox or vanc. And this is osteomyelitis. So your older patients that have like a, um, a pressure ulcer, if they're a diabetic, give them Piptaz. If there's someone that's had a surgery on their hip and now it's infected, you want to give them vancomycin or fluclox. Moving on, this is caused by streptococcus and more particularly group A beta hemolytic, and you give them penicillin V, which also is phenoxymethyl penicillin, I think is the full name, and that's rheumatic fever. So you might relate that to your cardiology revision, so all the stuff about the various murmurs it can cause. This one, you should all know, GAM, gentamicin, ampicillin, metronidazole. These are the patients that are post-op. They get these three antibiotics. So that's intra-abdominal sepsis, if they have this. Um, there's an exam question that floats around about the patient's about to go to surgery for laparotomy, and the options are like, do you give them metronidazole and keftriaxones, all these other iterations? Everyone argues about it, and I don't know what the correct answer is. So if you see that on the day, just try and narrow it down to two, pick 50-50. And if someone tells you they know their answer, they're probably wrong because they don't. Just um, if it's post-op, it's this. If it's pre-op, it'll be keftriaxone and something else, okay? I've seen that exam question floating around and no one really knows the answer to it. Um, for this one, you want to give them, I think, semen would carry this, co uh, carry, cover this. So the first uh, antibody you give is trimethoprim. If they're pregnant, you'll give them keflexin, and it's a UTI. So really important to remember these two things because they could easily chuck a question out. Clearly, it's a UTI, and they'll say the patient's pregnant. What do you give them? You don't want to put trimethoprim. Always remember keftriaxone is the exception to that. This one, Benpen and flucloxacillin. It's going to be impossible for you to work this out. Infective endocarditis. So you've got your drug users, you've got someone that's had a valve surgery and now they're very, very unwell. These are the two you want to give. Benpen and fluclox. Remember, fluclox is to cover your staph, which can be commonly caused in those conditions, particularly in IV drug users. MRSA, just remember you give VANC. Because it's, it's, remember, it's drug resistant. It's not, penicillins aren't going to attach it. You need to give them vancomycin. 
HIV, now this is the important one I remember um, for some OSCE stations. So when we talk about diagnosis of HIV, you give them an ELISA test 12 weeks after their exposure. So say someone's had a needle stick injury, for example, wait 12 weeks, then do the ELISA. If it's negative, awesome, they don't have it. If it's positive, you need to move on to a Western blot test, okay? So that's a really, really sensitive measure is the Western blot. However, ELISA is just for ruling it out. That's what you should probably know about HIV. It's really complicated to learn all the different viral loads at different points in time. I can't see how they could ask you a question about that, but they might ask you a question or an OSCE station that requires you to know this information. So this condition, if it's in the first two days since they've had their symptoms, you want to consider giving this drug. Elsaltamolvir for influenza. And also this one will be a patient or it might be in the cardiology question section. They'll talk about them having an itchy rash on one side of their chest. And in this case, it's shingles. So they might have a little bit of chest pain, but they'll make sure they say it's on one side and it's itchy and think shingles in that case. Don't get stuck and think it's a PE or it's something like some sort of ACS, shingles. This one, now there's two conditions that are very sim similar in this case. So you've got malaria and dengue. So try and have a think about which one you think this might be. Mosquitoes cause it. The patient will have fevers, some back pain and a rash, particularly on their chest. And it can become hemorrhagic fever and that's really bad with extremely high mortality rate. So this one's dengue. Dengue and malaria are very similar and it's hard to work around on exam questions. But remember this one, they won't have high swinging fevers, they'll just have fevers and it might make more of a mention about a rash the patient has. Malaria, so this patient sounds like the flu, they feel crook as, massive swinging fevers, fevers. they might have a big spleen, a big liver. To diagnose them, and particularly if you're OSCE, remember thick and thin, thin films. And also remember this, if a patient has a big spleen, so if you hear about it, splenomegaly on the exam question, think mild, malaria, myelofibrosis or CML, or the three M's. Basically, the way to differentiate dengue and malaria is just think, do they have back pain and do they have a rash somewhere? Diarrhea, I'm not gonna talk through these ones. This is extremely important, these. And I'll upload in the post lecture slides, Laura Panozzo's made a really good table that explains all of these bugs and the nature of conditions they cause. And that's worth learning. There's about 10 conditions. They don't really make much sense, but they can easily be exam questions. And if you know these facts, you'll be able to work out the question quite easily. It's good to look at which ones cause a, a bloody diarrhea because then you can knock it out to just have three. Uh, particularly remember as well that if you hear trophocytes, think amoeba histolytica. But you just gotta sit down and learn these ones and it's probably worth your time to remember these. Right. That's antibiotics and infectious disease. Let's finish off with derm. So there are three things you need to learn. SCCs, BCCs, and melanomas, okay? There's lots of other things like how do you describe the lesions, etc. Keep it simple. You're not dermatologists, you just need to know this stuff. So BCC, this is the most common one. Very rare they get metastases, but they can have local invasion, so it can cause some issues around their eye, for example. They'll talk about it being pearly, having telangiectasia, so the blood vessels are visible on there, and it can also have like kind of an ulcerated appearance. Management's quite simple, you just cut it out. So this, the question will just be, an older man on his face has a pearly lesion, what is it? And just think BCC if you hear pearly. SCC, so this is the second most common. And again, it spreads locally, but this one actually has the potential to metastasize. For this one, if you scratch it, it can bleed. It has those heaped edges you can see. It's quite tender to touch and it's a bit crusty. So again, they'll use those terms to describe it and you just need to know is it a BCC or an SCC? Management's the same, cut it out. For melanoma, so I'll explain the PR thing in a moment. Uh, there are four types of melanoma. Just remember superficial spreading is the most common, but the other three you really need to know a bit about them. Common thing in the OSCEs or in the exam questions talks about the Clark levels. So I just remember to PR because level two is papillary, P. Level four is reticular, R. Level one is just above papillary, level five is below reticular, level three is between the two. So just think PR when you hear melanoma and that's your Clark levels. It's a bit abstract, but it works really well in the exam questions, okay? So these are the melanomas, and this is what I think you need to know about them. The first one, superficial spreading, they'll get it on their face and it'll spread along, it won't invade the dermis, it might, but most likely stay on the top. Um, these patients get it quite late in life after a long time of exposure to the sun and it's got a really good prognosis. Nodular, as you can see, it looks like a nodule. They will spread vertically, so they'll go very deep and hence, they'll be quite bad. The thing with melanomas is how deep they go determines your prognosis. 
lentigo melanoma is it will stay in the epidermis. So again, it will be commonly on the face and it can invade really easily. Acryl, so that occurs in the soles and the palms. And it's more common in individuals with dark skin. And it carries a poor prognosis because it can be quite hard. These people will notice it and then go to the GP and cut out because it occurs on your nails particularly, which can be really difficult to identify. So just remember, superficial spe uh, spreading is most common. Nodulus vertigo. Lentigo will stay in the epidermis and acryl occurs in the soles and palms. Other two things, just remember, I've seen a few questions about them. Seboric keratosis, that's your middle-aged patients. So it's waxy stuck on appearance. Common occurs on the back. Solar or actinic keratosis, the other nickname is senile spots. So old people get them on their head. They look crusty, like you could pick them off if you touch them. They look like they're just sitting there. And they'll commonly occur on the head. So, questions. Have a read of these first. And if someone wants to pop up their hand after about 20 or 30 seconds, have a crack. Otherwise, we'll just get the answer and move on. So, you've got some atypical melanocytes. They extend along the basal layer of the epidermis in the skin biopsies from the forehead of sun-damaged skin. So, I'll give you a moment to think about it. And remember as well, if you had no idea what this was, just look for the word melanocytes and think melanoma, okay? So, you've got A, C, G, or H. And then if you still had no idea, it doesn't say anything about metastasis, like the patient's lost weight or they've got a lump, you know, in their chest. So you get rid of metastatic. Remember, lentigo occurs in people with darker skin on the palms and soles of their feet. There's nothing about that there, so get rid of lentigo. So we're left with A or G. To comment on the Clark level, we'd have to say how deep it's gone. And remember, PR, so reticular, if it was at level four, there's no mention about reticular. So G. So it's spread along the basal layer of the epidermis on the face. So think in situ superficial spreading melanoma. You just need to know some basic facts about these melanomas to get the answer right. Yep. Lentigo maligna. Yeah, I, um, give me one moment. So it could be this. I'm just going based off our Kami PowerPoint, what people have put as the answers. I think with uh, lentigo maligna, it's commonly um, gore malignant and spread quite deep, or it's metastasized to other areas. But have a look at it, and I'll double check it after the exam. We'll see if that's the right answer. I'm not exactly sure. I think it's G. That's what everyone else thought it was, but it could easily be C. That's right. But we'll check it out, and I'll put it in the post slides just to confirm if it's wrong, okay? <coughs> awesome. A typical melanocytes, so again, think melanoma, present within the reticular dermis in the skin biopsies from the back of a 50-year-old. So let's look at the ones that are relevant to melanoma. Notice here it says reticular dermis. So remember PR, R for reticular. That allows us to look at a Clark level. And remember, it's the fourth level reticular. So in this case, melanoma Clark level four. Um, basically, this using the PR thing just helps you answer this question. And apparently it's come up a few times. Um, and it's a very easy question for them to ask you in your OSCE. So, 7 year old man presents with a pale pink lesion on his left cheek. It's been present for years, and when stretched, the lesion has a clear pearly edge. So, whenever you see this, you've got to think, is it a BCC or an SCC? And just remember back, which one is caused, what causes that pearly appearance? So, have a think to yourself about that one. So, BCC. So, basically, any comment about a pearly lesion um, or pearly edges, basically, BCC is your answer. Next one, so we've got a 50-year-old female type 2 diabetic. She has urinary sepsis after a prolonged admission in the ICU. At discharge, she complains of hearing loss and vertigo. Now, I mentioned you didn't have to know anything about the exam, about the antibiotics' adverse effects. But what I want you to do is think back to whenever you've seen a med medication chart in the hospital. And remember the top left-hand corner, there's the variable dose drugs. The reason we look at the variable dose is because if they get too high, they can cause massive issues to the ears or in some other case, cause toxicity. So have a look at these. We're going to be looking for an antibiotic because they've had an infection. And then try and remember which, which medications you see in that top left-hand corner. What's likely happened to you is she's been on too high of a dose or it hasn't been dosed properly and she's got hearing loss, unfortunately, because it causes autotoxicity. So the only two antibiotics we've got here is A and E. So gentamicin is the one that sits in that top left-hand corner. So variable dosing of gentamicin to stop this autotoxicity. Next one, so we've got a 64-year-old alcoholic woman with cough and hemoptysis. So we've got two bits of information here. We've got a few bits of information here. The patient's an alcoholic, and we've got an x-ray as well to look at. Hopefully, you can see the abnormality. If you look in this top right-hand corner, 
got this lesion here. So I think if, if most of you have looked at this, you'd think, well, it could be TB because it's in the right top corner. But commonly with TB, they'll comment about the patient traveling overseas, being from overseas, or having a long period of weight loss. In this case, they haven't mentioned it. They've just got a cough and hemoptysis. So you've got a fluid level. So in this case, we're thinking lung abscess. But lung abscess, TB, TB would have lots of systemic features. So 35-year-old woman, she's got a left lower lobe pneumonia. And to summarize all that, she's a bit febrile. Her inflammatory markers are up, but she's not too unwell. So what, can, what bug do you think of if you hear of a patient that's got pneumonia and is quite well? Think mycoplasma or strep, they can commonly occur. The way to differentiate them is strep is a typical pneumonia, so it affects a particular lobe of the chest. So in this case, we've got a left lower lobe pneumonia, so streptococcus. So you could think it's E or G, but look and remember the X-rays localized to a particular lobe. Next one, 36-year-old male presents with food poisoning, and it occurred 24 hours after eating some chicken. They've had loose, watery, voluminous bowel actions. So if you hear chicken, what bug do you think? Yep, awesome, so salmonella. Um, but I have a look at all these bugs here and try to know a bit about them because these are the common ones they'll show on these exam options. Rightio, 21 year old woman presents with this bloody diarrhea and abdo pain. It's been there for five days, no medical history, but she came back from India one week ago, no contacts, no family history, but it still has trophocytes. So whenever you hear trophocytes, you've got to think of a certain bug. Let's see, Giardia. Yep, so trophocytes, think Giardia. Oh wait, did I have trophocytes up there for amoeba in the previous one? Sorry, that's a typo, it shouldn't be like that. Giardia has the trophocytes, amoeba's different, sorry. I'll, I'll change up in the post-lecture slides. Um, how about, let's have a little seat. Put your hand up if you think it's amoeba. You put your hand up if you think it's Giardia. Okay, so I'll double check this one, but I think I've done a bit of a typo where it should be amoeba because if we go back, oh, that's right. There we are. So amoeba, trophocytes and blood, Giardia, rotten egg gas when traveling. So amoeba, think trophocytes and blood. If you hear something like this patient's having stools that smell like rotten egg gas, it's Giardia. So in this case, the answer was, whoop. Yeah, sorry about that, I'll have to um, fix that up previously. Um, awesome, so next one. So we've got a young woman, comes to ED, 12, day, 12 hour history of a headache and neck stiffness. No allergies. Now, it's important to look at no allergies because if it said they're allergic to something, don't put that as the answer. On examination, you note she's agitated, febrile, photophobic, positive Koenig sign, and she has a purpuric rash on her hands and feet. So what do we think it is? Well, what, what condition do we think it is? Meningitis. Good. So what's the first one you give for meningitis? Yep, but it's not there. So in this case, if keftriaxone was there, I'd chuck it down because there's nothing to indicate she'd have listeria. So you want to go down to Benpen. Um, it's just because Keftriaxone's not there that Benpen's the answer. Oh, awesome, sweet. Um, so Benpen can be the answer in that case. But if uh, Keftriaxone was there, then you might have a bit more of a toss up about do we give Benpen or do we give Keftriaxone uh, as well? Perfect. So 50 year old woman, creamy vaginal discharge, discomfort for a week following a course of oral augmenting for a chest infection. So we're thinking our uh, vaginal thrush and we wanna then look at what are our antifungal medications here. So hopefully you can narrow it down to C and F. Then just have a think and see if you know the answer to this one. I wouldn't expect you to know the answer. This is one that you'll just know the answer by seeing this question and remembering it. So the answer in this case is clotrimazole. Clotrimazole is what you commonly use for vaginal thrush. And that's not really part of year three content, but it is on the year three exam. Just remember this question and have a way to remember whether it's clotrimazole or ketoconazole. But clotrimazole is what you give for vaginal thrush. Almost done. So Jody's a 30 year old, she lives on a dairy farm. 
Last 24 hours, she's felt unwell, has had some cramping pain, diarrhea with blood in it. It's quite an important fact there. She's febrile, but she's otherwise healthy. So she drinks water from an unboiled tank and drinks milk from their cows that they admit is not always pasteurized. Her husband also has mild fever and diarrhea. So it's something systemic. It's, occur it's affecting everyone in the family. Where she lives has been good rainfall and it's attracted lots of birds. Bird droppings have been more apparent. So I'll admit, I don't know the exact answer to this question, but I've narrowed it down to two possible options. So the first of which is to realize that she's drinking, un, uh, drinking unpurified water and lots of birds have come into the area recently and likely uh, pooed in it or bird droppings, they've pooed in it most likely. But she's also lives on a dairy farm. So does anyone have something they think of when they hear cows? Like uh, they talk about infectious disease involving cows. Campylobacter, yeah, that's a good one. And then for our second question, if we think of bird droppings in water, does anyone have any idea what you think of then? We'll run back to this summary side, just have a quick look at. Here we go. So cattle near water, sorry, it's cryptosporidium. And Campylobacter is chickens and birds. Now the reason I think it's Campylobacter is because it's got blood. But again, if you actually look at cryptosporidium, it can also cause blood in stools. So it's a bit complicated, but overall, I think the answer is Campylobacter, but I can't guarantee you on that one. This is one of those questions where if you see it, you're just gonna have to read about those conditions yourself and see what you think is the most likely option. But I would say it's probably Campylobacter considering the blood. Awesome. So overall bits of advice, that's basically it. Now, I'd suggest learning DERM, have a read of them, learn to recognize the images, because they can show you the image in, a, uh, in an OSCE station, for example. It doesn't take too long, and it's really low-hanging fruit. As you can see, those questions are pretty simple. Learn ID and antibiotics together. So don't spend too much time learning about the specific antibiotics. You can if you want, but you can probably spend your time better elsewhere. And realize as well that you're better off to learn about the condition and what symptoms cause it, and then the appropriate medication for it. And definitely learn those buzzwords I have listed out, and I'll post the full table. And I'll check those two questions, okay? Because that's a good point about Lentigo, Maligna. Um, and I'll make sure that those are the right ones based on stuff. And as always look at the PBS or whatever uh, the uh, TGA says is the first line for that condition. Because the faculty probably cross-checks their answers with that because it can change. They don't want to be contradicting what the prescribing rules say. Awesome. Have a good afternoon. Good luck for the exam. Chloe.